Good morning, good afternoon, everyone, uh, and welcome to this Global Talks on Understanding and Improving Transboundary Boundary Watershed Governments by our own Ben Perrier today. Um, my name is, yeah, for those on the call who don't know me, my name is Oliver Schmidt, I'm directing the Center for Global Studies, and uh, my role today is relatively limited. Uh, first of all, um, let me um, start this session by acknowledging with respect that uh, we, with respect to the Kwangans peoples on whose traditional territory the University of Victoria stands, and the Songhees, Kwama, and the Sanj peoples whose historical relationship with the land continue to this day. Um, with this, I would like to hand things over. I'm not sure who goes first. So is it Michelle Lee or Oliver Brandes uh, leading us into today's session? I think, Michel Moore, it's wonderful to see you back. You know, you're reaching us, I think, from Stockholm today. Uh, so thank you very much for being with us in late afternoon um, in Europe. So, Michel Lee, if you want to start off um, introducing this session, that'd be great. Sure, I can start and then Oliver, you can jump in. I'll start actually quite narrow and then and then Oliver will probably take it much broader. And then Ben, you can take us back, zoom us back in on the details. Um, this project has um, is known as Refresh, the bigger project that we share and it's a partnership with Polis and with BIG and with CFTS. So it was our first kind of four way partnership. Um, and it was part of a, a it was funded by WEPGEN, which was the Water Economics Policy and Governance Network originally, um, which was one of these larger SHRC um, grants, a partnership grants. And so it started um, uh, quite a few years ago. And I think in some ways this has been one of the nicest things about this partnership is, is that the research portion of it, I think, has had you know, it's kind of come in, in fits and starts where there's some intense periods of activity and then periods where it's slower, where we're kind of fumbling for new questions and, um, and, and kind of, yeah, also finishing theses and things, things like that that are more maybe slow burns. Whereas Polis kind of keeps this momentum going with regular engagements, which I'll let Oliver explain more. But I think it's, again, this benefit of the two kind of going in parallel so that it doesn't feel like we lose you know, when we're in those moments of maybe slower research activity, it's not like we've lost momentum in actually what's happening on the ground. Um, so it's been super beneficial, at least from the, the point of Wig Labs perspective. And um, really, the, I'll just give the quick snapshot of the purpose of it at, at the, you know, kind of briefest version is we were just looking for innovations that we could um, suggest as potential, you know, changes to water governance at the Canada-US border in the Columbia Basin, um, recognizing that the treaty was up for possible renegotiation when we started and, and now is has passed that deadline and, and discussions are going on. This was pre-Trump years, activity sort of slowed in the Trump years, which I'm sure Oliver can explain more of as well. Um, and so again, we, we had this question, we've, we've sort of been searching around. So we looked at, um, and Jesse um, Baltutis was one of the PhD students funded through this, and he was looking at ideas around re, um, kind of bordering processes, obviously shaped a lot by the work with BIG. Um, he was looking at polycentric governance. Does that make sense as a possible innovative governance form? Does that fit here? Is there a shift to be made from a kind of state-based governance, um, governing arrangement right now. Um, and we also partnered with Dustin Garrick, who at the time was at McMaster University. He has since moved to Oxford. And he also had a graduate student. Her name was Kelsey Leonard. Um, she's from the Shinnecock Nation. She's now currently an assistant professor at the University of Waterloo. She's since fin finished her PhD, and she was taking a, um, a look at a lot of um, Indigenous-led conservation efforts in relationship to climate change adaptation in Columbia Basin and a few other watersheds as well. So along the way, we also then decided, okay, maybe it's not a concept or a form, it's maybe method and process. So we also tested an idea around social innovation lab. Um, the timing on that ended up not being quite right. The communities are, are 
overwhelmed with engagements and consultations already. So layering on another process didn't make sense. And then comes along Benjamin uh, with another concept for us to explore to say, hey, maybe this, this is an idea for thinking about a way to rethink um, governance in this particular area. And a big part of the question is, this has always been a Canada to US, obviously recognizing um, nationhood of indigenous nations, Oliver and myself and others have been thinking about this, these bilaterals no longer make sense. They're not recognizing nationhood if we take that seriously. So what are our alternatives? So I'll leave it there. That's kind of the bigger questions to, to lay out the context for you. Um, and Oliver, if you wanna hop in. Wonderful, <laughs> thank you. And it's a, a great project not just because of the people involved, uh, Michelle Lee at the tip of the spear, but the many people involved. And I think, you know, from a, so this warms my, my heart on many levels because from a CFGS perspective, it's a wonderful example of this integrated approach, right? The vision where we can get multiple projects working together and bringing kind of their superpower, their expertise and seeing what we, what, what kind of a, smoothie we can make out of that we throw some ingredients in the blender and see and in this occasion ben is our is our uh, uh mixer making some uh interesting pieces as michelle lee has kind of given you a bit of the trajectory and from a polis perspective you know our job is to kind of challenge the policy application but to do policy well especially innovation and policy well you need that sort of new ideas the new direction and that reinforces a key message. And, and I think one of the, the, the good example of the kind of funding that has underpinned this, which as Michelle Lee mentioned was WebGen. And I just wanna put a little call out to a, a, a fellow named Stephen Renzetti, who was a water economist, Canada's leading water economist. He was the lead behind that. He passed away sadly, unexpectedly, but he was a really important early mentor for Polis, but his vision really was always that blend. He was a very strong academic and he would even acknowledge sometimes too academic, but he understood the importance of policy and how to make that academic work really relevant. And so he tried to create as many spaces for that to happen. And this is that living example where we see the four projects, as Michelle Lee uh, mentioned, all under the wonderful tent of the Center for Global Studies and a chance to, to both do the exploratory work at the same time as grounding it in reality. And that's uh, where Polis's role has come in. Uh, and, and I wanna acknowledge John O'Reardon, who's also on the call with us today. He's really been a powerful force and Polis has been able to insert ourselves at key moments as the government considered its options. And when I say government, the BC government in particular, now we know that when it comes to international treaties, federal government should be a priority, but they really weren't the leads on this. It was really BC's interest. And it was a chance to really do something different, both from a governance institutional perspective about the role of indigenous and the role of place or a really concrete watershed based approach, but also that timing and the really interesting politics of dealing with a neighbor and a partner who uh, maybe isn't always as a linear or as rational as you might think during these uh, very interesting political times. So, so it was a really fascinating interplay and I don't wanna go on too long, but I really wanna encourage this session is really the challenge. And we've been challenging Ben to mix that. Ben is a big thinker, we all know that, and he's a very creative person and he has wonderful insights. And we're trying to, to harness the big picture part at the same time as grounding it in some anchors so that we can talk about what is needed next where do we go? How do we bring that vision? And then how do we operationalize it? And we're still at the thinking big vision part. And I really appreciate everyone joining us to help Ben think this through, challenge him creatively, challenge him groundedly, work together and think about what this may look like over the next year or two. This is sort of one of those projects where we didn't have an end in mind. It's growing and we'll see where it is. So with that, Ben, and uh, too much long-winded, uh, I really uh, look forward to this conversation. Thank you. So I will start by sharing my screen. So um, thank you, uh, Michelle Lee. Thank you, Oliver. Uh, thank you, Emmanuel, also for his support. Thank you, CFGS and uh, adorable team, uh, Oliver, 
uh, Jody and Stephanie. Uh, connecting the dots is, is the well-known phrase that has guided my work in this research on the transboundary governance of shared waters between Canada and the United States. Uh, the title of my global talk invites us to reflect on the diversity and pluralism of forms, tools, and actors in the area of cross-border governance of shared waters between Canada and the United States. Um, specifically, it involves thinking, thinking about the complementary um, complementarity theory between the dimension of international relations and the dimension of transnational relations in, in matters of uh, shared water governance. We, today, we will not be talking about uh, international water law or international environmental law. Uh, our object is cooperation and governance across international borders between multiple uh, legal entities. For the record, uh, BC is the, is, the, is, the, is the entity where the international environmental law uh, were born with the 1941 trail smelter arbitration. Um, this uh, award um, established the principle that no state can cause or permit its territory to, to cause serious environmental damage to another state. So BC is, uh, is, has a long story with the international uh, environmental law, but is not our topic uh, today. Um, so this work, as uh, Oliver and Michelle said, uh, is still exploratory. It's just a step. It will be consolidated later. This is a global talk, finally, special feedback. Uh, and I will speak, I have 20 slides, so I will speak quickly. Uh, and uh, after that, we will share comments and questions. So uh, my outline, uh, I will speak uh, successively of the position of the problem, of the theoretical framework uh, I chose, and I will present the situation at the Canada-United States border. Then I will focus on the Great Lakes, on the Yukon Basin, and finally on the Columbia River. <laughs> this uh, global talk uh, exam examines the legal landscape of cross-border governance or transboundary governance at the uh, Canada-US border. And the goal of this, uh, this research is about identifying the dominant trends. Uh, I uh, identify a research question uh, and I will share with you this research question. This research question is how and to what extent can the governance of transboundary watersheds be improved by a transnational legal framework or and by a transnational juridical networks. Here is a map of the 286 transboundary watersheds around the world. Um, since then, uh, researchers have updated the number of these basins and they have discovered 310 international watersheds. And these uh, 310 basins face the same legal challenges. Uh, all are linked to the dominant architecture of the legal world, the political division of territories by international borders. If you see this map, you also see that the world is fragmented into several territories. So what you really see, what you really see is actually the dominant architecture of this world that originated from the sovereign states. Uh, in the classic and the modern reading, Canada and the United States share 20 large transboundary basins. <coughs> and among them are the Great Lakes uh, St. Lawrence Basin, the Yukon Basin, and the Columbia River Basin. Um, if the legal world is fragmented, the transboundary governance of shared waters is precisely aimed at trying to reconnect the spatial and legal fragments of these waters. 
if the borders cut, cross-border and transboundary governance brings together. Um, as water creates links between different, different, different countries, we must be able to think of these links in terms of cooperation, coordination, and governance. And also, of course, the growing pressure on water resources makes it urgent to develop principles and tools capable uh, of uh, managing conflicts between uses and states and multiple other actors uh, in order to preserve uh, this uh, resource and more largely the ecosystems linked to the water. Um, let's start also by the position of the problem. So, water is life. The water circuit does not obey territorial separations. The dominant legal model is structured on notion structures and matrix regimes such as the sovereignty of states in their territory and the sovereignty also of states in the international sphere. Um, for the recur, the first international treaty concerned water and irrigation issue more than 4,000 years ago. So as, uh, as we notice, uh, international law is far before the ap ap appearance of the states in the 17th century and the uh, legal problems issue uh, appeared long time before the legal modality. <clears throat> so what is the position of the issue we are raising today? Um, we need to have this idea of the legal world in, the, in our mind. Um, the world around us is built on dominant legal, with dominant legal representations that influence us every day. Among them, international borders, uh, the figures of sovereign states, and the conceptualization of the legal universe into two separate, separate spheres. The domestic sphere is separated from the international sphere. Uh, this conceptual conceptualization between these two spheres, the domestic and the international uh, one, as, a, as a separated, is, uh, is the is from the, the, the thinker and the legal thinker, uh, Emer, Emer de Vatel. And in this conceptualization, the domestic relations, uh, the, sorry, the foreign relations are the, competence, uh, are the competence of the central states. Um, two, two more uh, detailed questions. Um, we know that the notion of governance calls for the presence of actors other than the state governments. But then, what places do these non-state actors have in cross-border governance? Um, as the transboundary dimension means international dimension, how can non-state actors, I'm speaking about the state actors as the federal states or the unitarian states, participate in the governance of shared waters. Finally, is a cooperative relationship across borders necessarily an international relationship? Uh, that's the question. Maybe we could think differently and we could add another layer uh, in the general thinking about the transboundary relations between multiple actors. Of course, this question raises many technical sub-questions, sub-questions such as the notion of the subject in international law. For now, it's only the states, the international organization, and sometimes the individuals with the human rights. So uh, this international sphere is a little bit a uh, elite club of states. And uh, that's the model we need to challenge a little bit uh, more. And of course, other technical questions as the question of the competence of non-state actors in international relations. And each question is a specific branch of legal research. So what is the, finally, what, what could we see when, when we 
look at the transboundary water governance between Canada and the United States, what could we see and also in, in, in the general uh, world land, landscape? Uh, we could notice the presence and the activity of states, but also we could notice the presence and activity of, of, of actors other than states. The idea, the main idea here in this research is to consider all the actors involved in the transboundary governance of shared waters. In this global talk, I uh, therefore propose to think in terms of a paradigm shift. When we observe the phenomenon of cross-border governance of shared waters, we observe that the legal landscape contains two complementary dynamics. A classic one, modern type, the international law of states, in particular, the law of international cooperations of states, which use the tool of the treaty uh, is, the, is the main tool, legal tool in the international sphere between states. But we also observe the dynamics of the action of transnational and cross-border cooperation between actors who are not the governments of the federal states and in this case, uh, Canada and United States. But we notice the presence and the huge activities of other sovereign actors, such as the First Nations and the tribal nations, but also at the subnational levels, some actors as the provinces, uh, the municipalities, uh, administrative agencies, associations, uh, which all these other actors use legal tools other than the treaty uh, of the international law. In short, the legal landscape of transboundary governance of shared waters is absolutely not limited to the international intergovernmental action of uh, federal states and central governments. There is therefore, sorry, I need to, oh, okay. There is therefore indeed an international dimension of the transboundary governance of shared waters, and there is a transnational dimension of the transboundary governance of shared waters. Uh, at this phenomenon, um, the transnational relations, of course, are different than the classic model of international relations. That's the purpose of this global talk. I would like to share with you this. Uh, I would like emphasize the second dimension. I, I, I won't focus a lot about the international dimension, which is very important. And it's, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, the presence of this international relation by the international treaties are very important, of course, in this modern world. Um, but I will focus more on this, uh, on this shift, on this uh, importance of these transnational relations, transboundary transboundary relations between uh, different actors than the states. Okay. Let me go the other So in a nutshell, I like these two uh, phrases of, of, the, of this thinker, Frank Latty. Um, for him, as you could read, uh, he uses this Latin formula, UB societies, societas, EB use. Uh, it means one thing very important. It means uh, the law and the international, um, the law, uh, sorry, the law is not only the monopoly of the states and in the transboundary uh, matters, the international law is not the as not the monopoly of the transboundary governance relations. So let me let me develop a little bit more this this uh, this this two dynamics between the international dimension and the transnational dimension. Who are in who are, who are with different nature, but who are also connected, which are also connected. Uh, we could we could briefly compare these two types of relations across borders, these two legal dimensions of trans transboundary governance of shared waters. 
uh, I have identified some main characteristics, main tools, and uh, forms. <clears throat> As I said, there are two categories of actors that emerge. The states like Canada and USA and actors who are not states, but who are of uh, another legal nature. Of course, as we know, we live in the modern world dominated by states. States are ambassadors and actors of this, of this legal internationalism. And uh, as they are the ones who developed the dominant legal architecture of the world, they know this internationalism very well. And it is the states which voluntarily make international law. All international law is based on their mutual, mutual consent. International law can't exist without the consent of the states. And, uh, and these states mobilize, mobilize the tools of international law, such as treaties, uh, which are the type of legal contract uh, between states. And this contract, through this contract, they have rights and duties, reciprocal rights and duties with other states. Um, we some scholars use this expression of hard law uh, in this legal internationalism. We have uh, the dominant, the the, the majority of uh, of the legal tools are uh, hard. It means uh, they are binding agreement, like these famous international treaties. But the states could also use uh, some soft law. Indeed. Juridical transnationalism at the opposite, they use more what other scholars say soft law. It means non-binding agreement. Of course, not binding through the prism of the modern law. Huh? <clears throat> so we have a lot of tools, legal tools, as the memorandum of understandings, as uh, declarations, charters. Finally, they are good faith agreements. And uh, and uh, the typical forms of the legal internationalism are uh, made through the international public law. It means the law of international treaties, the law of international organizations. And in the other side, uh, with the other dynamic of the juridical transnationalism, we, uh, we could notice a lot of uh, transnational networks, a lot of transnational municipal networks, a lot of transnational regional initiatives and also a transnational policy network. So it's very connected to the what I call the transnational law. Um, and uh, I will speak a little bit uh, about that. Because that's the main idea. What is the transnational law finally? Um, um, transnational law would be the set of rules, mechanisms, and institutions which tend to regulate transboundary governance by non-state actors. Um, let's ask ourselves uh, two questions about this transnational law. Uh, what, what are the theoretical foundations of this notion of transnational law? And what could be the normate, normative content of this transnational law? Um, First, um, about the theoretical foundations, the working hypothesis is that there are non-state actors with an international scope, international in quotation marks, and that interstate society finally are not the only, um, are not the only international societies. We have transnational communities. So, I'm going a little bit on the more deeper. Uh, we must therefore imagine a kind of law that would include the study of all human societies in their states or not. Uh, this implies, of course, a relativization. A, uh, um, yeah, a relativization of the monopoly uh, that the modern states wanted to establish over the law. In short, the legal phenomenon of, of transboundary governance is much larger and more complex than simply the international law of transboundary governance. 
the law, the international law of transboundary governance, it's just one aspect of it. Um, this transnational law idea is uh, linked to the idea of the legal pluralism. Uh, what it means, legal pluralism, it means you don't have one source of law from one type of actors. You have multi forms of, uh, they call, they use this term, juridicity. Juridicity is the character of something who is legal. In short, uh, it's not just state law, there are several types of law. And finally, let us let us recall that the law is a social discipline and a tool for regulating social relations and not only the state, uh, the, federation, the, federa the, federa the federal state uh, tool. Concretely, for, for it means um, that as soon as there is strong solidarity between human groups, even beyond borders, a form of transnational legal organizations emerge. So second question, what is the content of, or what could be the content of, of this transnational law when we apply, when we transpose this idea of transnational law in the transboundary water governance? I think it uh, simply uh, follows the observation of existing practices, um, the repetition of such an, of these clauses or these dispositions, the repetition of this type of agreement, the repetition of these approvals of these mechanisms. And the transnational uh, rules would be finally uh, the rules uh, that the transboundary partners would gradually give to themselves in order to cooperate and to organize co and also to co-construct something in common. And of course, um, also obviously, the study of this uh, transnational law will be uh, linked or accompanied by the analysis of its external coherence. That is to say of its ability to resist, uh, uh, to resist the grip of the dominant systems. Okay, now we have uh, finished with the analytical and theoretical framework. Let's go in the empirical uh, studies. What could we see at the uh, international border between United States and Canada at the international level? And what could we see? Uh, what is the international landscape in the Great Lakes, in the Yukon and in the Columbia River? And what is also the transnational peace in the Great Lakes, in the Yukon, and in the Columbia uh, River Basin. Um, of course, uh, the entire uh, dyad border uh, between Canada and United States um, is, is, uh, is the product of a lot of international treaty of delimitations successively. Uh, and the, the famous one is this treaty uh, of boundary waters treaty from 1909 and uh, 1910. And this treaty has a specific importance is in the legal history of trans transboundary uh, water governance between US and Canada because uh, it created the International Joint Commission. And this International Joint Commission is a kind of international organization completely linked to, uh, to the, the, the federal uh, government with, with an independent and very uh, important uh, independent role of, uh, of, um, of making report, of, um, of uh, making studies, of uh, also uh, to, to, to smooth the relations between the two states. So uh, it, it, this international uh, um, International Com Joint Commission plays a very important role and in this transboundary water governance. And the, lat the latest report, the latest report of this International Joint Commission 
from December 2020. So it's very, uh, it's very, uh, um, it's very close to us. Illustrates the news and the progress of this international institution. But is just one layer of the complexity of the legal landscape uh, about transboundary water governance. Uh, I, 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 I do not forget to mention the two, uh, the two, um, the two activities of these two, two activities, uh, maybe the, not the two main activities, but two important uh, activities of the International Joint Commissions. It's, uh, they created uh, international watershed and river boards that's a tool very useful to control and monitor the quality of the water, the level of the rivers. So they play a very important role. And these uh, boards are uh, in the different um, water international basins. And you have also the international watershed initiatives. Uh, that, uh, that's what I wanted to uh, mention today. So let's see what is this land, what is the legal landscape? of the Great Lakes. What is the legal landscape and these two dimensions? What is uh, the international uh, part and what is the transnational part? Um, so maybe you know the Great Lakes area includes a large number of actors and, 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 uh, and a lot of uh, diffused and distributed governance at several levels. At the international and federal level, states have, for example, created the International Joint Commission in charge of water qualities. So, um, and in charge also of the lake levels, and this commission is also managing the binational bi disputes. At the sub-federal uh, level, the Canadian provinces and uh, the, the American states, federated states, have signed several agreements including the Conference of Great Lakes St. Lawrence Governors and Premiers in 1983 and the Great Lakes Charter. Let's focus a little bit on the, on the Great Lakes Charter. This Great Lakes Charter, so from uh, 1985, uh, they have elaborated a charter. So it's a soft law, it's a charter, it's a soft law between these two uh, these two entities, the provinces and the international, the federated states, because in the United States, the we we, we shouldn't forget the United, um, the, sorry, the federated state in USA, have don't have the capacity to enter in international relations uh, with other legal entities in other countries. It's a constitutional. It's a, it's a, it's an interdiction. Uh, written in the constitution. But they could use soft law agreements. That's the idea of this Great Lakes Charter. And uh, we could notice in the principle one, integrity of the Great Lakes Basin, the water resources of the basin transcend political boundaries within the basin and should be recognized and treated as a legal, single ideologic uh, system. Let's Let's move on on the uh, more local level. And we notice the existence of a transnational network of cities all around the lakes. This network brings together about 130 American and Canadian mayors. And this transnational networks, uh, network aims uh, to improve the protection and restoration of the waters and aquatic ecosystem of the lakes. It plays an important role in uh, diagnosis, communication, uh, information exchange at the interlocal level of the Great, Great Lakes. If we, now let's speak about the, 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 the importance of indigenous people in these Great Lakes. They have, of course, I recall that indigenous people have a historical continuity with their traditional territories and have regulated the waters and lands uh, within their territories since uh, time immemorial. Um, at the level of the sovereign First Nation and the sovereign tribal nations, there is a very great activity of cooperation through the border, through the modern borders. And um, 
both finally both also at the cross border and and border levels some projects are, are only in canada and some other projects are only in united states but we can't uh, analyze uh, this uh, project without uh, connection because they are all connected with the great lakes basin and uh, in uh, 2004 uh, 40 uh, First Nations, 40 tribes sign uh, a, a treaty, they call that uh, Accord. And in this treaty, is, uh, they share with us uh, their, their concerns. And of course, they also refer to this uh, Charter of the Great Lakes made by the province and, and the United States, uh, and the, sorry, yeah, the, the states from the United States, by saying, this charter didn't didn't uh, bring us in the in the in the land, legal landscape. So they by themselves they do as sovereign entities. They have developed their own uh, re legal relations uh, th trans about transboundary water governance, and we have a lot of examples like that, like the water declaration of the Ike in Ontario, like the Indigenous Environmental Network. Uh, and and, uh, and uh, the, I have noticed in this declaration uh, from, uh, from 2004, they connect, they referred to the Kerry Oka declarations. It was, uh, it was an important international declaration from, uh, from the Rio plus 20, so uh, in 1992. Um, so that was the legal landscape in the Great Lakes. Let's move on and quickly on the Yukon River Basin. This Yukon River Basin is a very also interesting example of a lot of um, transboundary governance systems between uh, First Nations and also uh, between uh, users of these uh, waters. And uh, the, the most important uh, transboundary organization is the Yukon River Intertribal Watershed Council. It's uh, an indigenous grassroots organization uh, created in 1997. Uh, it's a 75 um, First Nation and Alaska native tribes who, uh, who agreed to improve the health and the well being of the watershed and the people who live within it. Inside this Yukon River Intertribal Watershed Council, they have developed a very interesting tool, a transboundary indigenous observation network. Uh, it's an indigenous-led community-based water quality monitoring, monitoring network. It's, uh, as I said, between the tribes in the Yukon, in the Canadian part, and uh, with the tribes in Alaska. Uh, they use a memorandum of understanding to create this uh, network, but a memorandum of, of understanding between the U.S. Geological Survey and the Yukon River Intertribal Watershed Council. So we are, as I said in the introduction, in this uh, transnational dimension. They use other tools, and this tool, even though they, some other could call that soft, but they play a very effective a concrete and, uh, and uh, important role in the legal relation between uh, legal entities. And you have other kind of, uh, of uh, legal institution as this one, the Yukon River Panel, but this one is, uh, is, um, uh, is the union between users and specifically fishers uh, of this Yukon River. La, uh, on this slide, you have the map of this uh, of this network of uh, of, uh, of uh, this indigenous observation network. Uh, you could see a, a lot of black points, and all these points are a site of analysis of the quality of the of the of the river. And important things in this network, they shared this, the they shared the methodology, the knowledge of indigenous people. At the same time, they, should, they, they, they share also the, <coughs> the, the modern science knowledge. So it's, they agreed together to, to build uh, a common knowledge with these two methods. 
So it's a very interesting example. So what's going on in this Columbia River Treaty? <coughs> so what is the legal landscape of this Columbia River Treaty? Uh, what is the weight of the international relation? But where are the transnational relations? Um, do we have a balance between these two dimensions or the only international dimension is the, 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 major, the major dynamic? Um, of course, um, um, after the rich examples of the Great Lakes and, and the Yukon, um, let's focus now on the Columbia River Treaty. Uh, anyone who wants to understand the history of the Columbia River Treaty must know the development of American law from the beginning of the 20th, 20th century for this region. He uh, must know also the construction project of the Grand Coulee Dam complex. He uh, must be familiar with the giant Columbia River Basin projects, irrigation, which is different than the Columbia River Basin. Huh? It's a small project, but well, a small project is a smaller project, but with a lot of consequences uh, for the irrigation and the agriculture in the Washington state. Because if we know the geography, before um, it was, um, they called that a Columbia Plateau. It was a kind of arid, arid, very arid land. And some, uh, some farmers and some engineers at the end of the 19th century started to think to irrigate this arid, uh, arid land. It was a kind of a plateau, a desert without, uh, without so much vegetation. So they, they think it could be a good place to irrigate um, for the purposes of the agriculture. Uh, that's the origin of this Columbia River Basin project. In, uh, so in a nutshell, the Columbia River Treaty is an international law treaty between Canada and United States, signed in 1961, entered into force in 1964, but you need to to, to, to understand the historical and legal background of this uh, Columbia River Treaty to have a better knowledge of what's going on now and why it's important. And uh, of course, we don't have to forget at the time of uh, in 1961, 1964, and after the study, the specific study made by the International Joint Commission in 19, between 1944, because the Inter International Joint Commission started to study um, the possibility to extend, to, to use better the river of the Columbia River in 1944. And after 15 years of studies, the International Joint Commissions, by the, after the request of the United States and Canadian government, uh, uh, published a report uh, as uh, it's a good idea. They balance the cost they balance the cost and the and the and the wins, and they decided to uh, create uh, to engage in this Columbia River Treaty. Of course, unfortunately, and uh, they they voluntarily they voluntarily ignore uh, some uh, some uh, key features as the fish problematic, and of course they voluntarily ignore the presence and the rights and the sovereign, uh, um, sovereign powers of tribal nations and first nations. I say voluntarily because they made this balance and in some reports in the 30s, in the 40s, it's uh, in the very, very technical reports, uh, the, the, the tribal nations uh, were included in the studies, in the scientific studies of this Columbia River Basin and uh, some, uh, some um, in this report, we could clearly see uh, they were aware about the loose of the, international, the First Nation lands or the Tribal Nation lands. They were completely aware about that, but finally they decided to not uh, to in this, uh, in this uh, criticable, of course, balance of cost and benefits, they decided to move on with this idea of the treaty. And uh, just for recalling, uh, with this uh, with this Columbia River Treaty, Canada uh, engaged uh, itself to to build three dams in the Canadian territory. 
to uh, allow flood control and optimize the production of hydroelectricity in both states. And with these three dams, it's also provided additional water reservoirs for 15.5 million acre feet. Um, so what's, what's going on now with the current Columbia Treaty, and I will finish in one minute, and I will welcome uh, all your comments, remarks, and feedbacks. Um, of course, the Columbia River Treaty has also established a permanent engineering board, but I, I'm, I'm not entering the details of the, of the legal disposition of the treaty. And as we know, since the last, for the last 10 years, they have developed a reviewing process where, um, where in 2013, United States decided to, to review the process. And at the same time, Canada, Canada decided to review the process in, and the, the, uh, since 2019, they developed some uh, some meetings regularly. Uh, it's the tenth tenth round of meeting from last year. But since the tenth round of last year, uh, the Canadian uh, side has not received yet any information about the United States uh, ideas of how they will uh, review the process. Uh, um let's see one thing is also of course for the united states if uh, um, i'm not mistaken the most important thing uh, one of them is the reintroduction of the salmon in the columbia river basin above the grand coulee dam because this grand coulee dam i didn't say that before uh, cut the flow of salmon uh, towards the upper 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 columbian basin of course, we have other issues as the impact of invasive species, the uh, some modernization of the hydropower and the energy efficiency. Uh, of course, some also climate change related impacts, uh, etc. Sorry, you could see quickly the size of the Colombian river basin at the left and the Canadian part of the Colombia. Uh, river basin at the right and I'm familiar with the size of the Columbia River Basin because I'm from France and this Columbia River Basin is bigger than uh, the, the French country. Uh, so it's, it's a huge country on the map of course it's very small but it's a sorry it's a very huge uh, basin with, with geographically in a nutshell, you have the branch of the Snake Lake, the branch of the Columbia River, and the common the common river between the Snake and the Columbia River uh, after after the Dales uh, Dam, and, and uh, yeah, and uh, geographically also we need to have the clear understanding of the mountains, not only about the water and the hydrological basin, but also about the mountains and the Rocky Mountains in the Canadian Park are very, very um, important because they are, they are higher and bigger than the mountains in the Washington state. And that's why it explains that, the, that, the, that the, the amount, the volume of the water is very important, even though it's a little, it's just 15% of the, of the area of the Columbia Basin, but because these mountains, the, the flow of, of water from Canada is very important. What is the international dimension in this Columbia River Basin? And what is the transnational dimension in this Columbia Basin? So we could see you have international treaties, of course. You have inter-tribes and First Nation uh, legal uh, relation by this, uh, specifically this Silks United Declaration between the Okanagan Nation Alliance and the Colville Confederated Tribes. You have also project of, uh, between academia and Barbara Cousin is, uh, is the leader uh, on this project. You have also uh, some, a lot of associations, a lot of NGO uh, and a lot of networks between NGO for the restoration of river, uh, river systems. You have also some agreement between the, the federate states, so between the United Federated States and the provinces of Canada. You have also important agreement between interagency 
a specific agreement between the Columbia Basin Interest and the Northwest Power and Conservation Council. You have also a technical uh, relation between inside this engineering board. You have also uh, multi-level governance, specifically in this great Northern Landscape Conservation Cooperative. And you have also uh, a huge organization at the public-private uh, level. It's an organism which is mixing uh, uh, important leaders in the economic and at the political level. And this, uh, this pointer has a specific water uh, policy working group. So all this, this, uh, all this example are illustrating the the international dynamic and, of course, the transnational dynamic. And we need to have both dynamics in mind to have uh, the more accurate picture of the transboundary governance uh, landscape in the Columbia River Basin. Okay, I, I, won't speak, I won't speak very much about the Columbia Treaty Review, the detail of what, what USA thinks about that, what the expert thinks about that what the Canada and the province of BC think about that. Um, the important things to remember is the situation, the legal situation has completely changed from 1961 uh, up to now. Uh, the legal, the legal, the legal uh, dimension has completely changed with this presence of uh, multitudinous actors at different levels and uh, uh, and the, the presence of First Nation and Tribal Nation, their rights and the title and their sovereignty are more and more every day uh, taking uh, uh, more and more signification in, in, in the negotiation between the two states. Okay, so what are, uh, it's my uh, last slide, what are the main findings and main learnings International law is not the only legal dimension. The treaty is not only the legal dimension. We need to have a, a better a transnational approach of, uh, for, for, the, for the future of this Columbia Basin uh, governance. Um, internationalism and the treaties are important, of course, at their level between states, and they have also a huge importance to irrigate the, the movement of the protection of the Columbia River Basin. Uh, at the, in, in this sense, they could help local powers, they could help local authorities, by example, by the, the, the new federal agency of the, in Northern Canada. By creating this kind of agency, they should be uh, uh, harmonized better the legal landscape of water in, in the Canadian country. But of course, in parallel to this international dimension, you have this transnationalism uh, built on transnational networks between different actors, and we can't avoid the importance of uh, of these legal of these legal actors because they are part. They are concretely part of the uh, real legal reality of this Columbia River Basin. And finally, this idea of transnationalism, this, this idea of transnational law is kind of uh, subsidiarization and democratization of this international world, uh, as we know, reserved between the, the states. Um, and these transnational relations help to connect the global world to the interlocal uh, dimensions. To conclude, some emerging research questions. Borders are a place of reconciliations, as Merrill Fair, uh, Merrill and Fair, Fair proposed in 2013. We could think better about the role of indigenous knowledge and indigenous legal orders in the transboundary water governance. Of course, uh, since the adoption by uh, by BC and soon by the Canada about this um, uh, declaration of and the rights of indigenous people act. We have some consequences, not specifically with the Article 36 and the Article 46. And as John Burroughs and other legal scholars uh, have proposed, we need to connect the legal orders all together. And I like this idea and I like this, this book and I like this title of this book. Uh, 
because the international legal order should be connected better with the national legal order and they should be connected better with the First Nation and tribal legal orders. And I propose, it's my last word, to have this idea in mind. Instead of water without borders, we could think about water within boundaries and specifically with the planetary boundaries and of course these watershed boundaries and also with the ancestral territories of First Nations, which have been recognized by the last Supreme Court decision one month ago. Uh, they recognize the existence of this uh, transboundary uh, ancestral territory. And I will finish by this uh, little metaphor. A limit originally is not only a delimitation, it's also a pathway. And I'm looking forward as a new pathway, which is more um, peaceful and more accurate for the better governance of water between the United States and uh, Canada. Thank you very much for your attention. I was a little bit long, but I'm happy to have shared all these ideas with you. And now I'm ready for your feedback. Thank you very much, uh, Ben. You know, clearly, you know, you needed the time. The complexity of the issues is very evident. And I think uh, your reflection on the nature and, and understanding of the transboundary watershed governments uh, gives us a good example of how fruitful the collaboration also between the different projects at the center, Polis, Big, you know, Wiglab, you know, has been in trying to to enhance our understanding of what it means really to take on. Uh, watershed governments across different national borders and, you know, what role borders play in this respect.